Hi everybody, today is part of our Journeys to Optimal Health series. I have the pleasure of speaking with Rachel Richards. Rachel is a New York State licensed and board certified massage therapist. She's also the host of a popular YouTube channel where she shares self-care help to an audience which is now, I believe, getting close to 70,000. And she is also the author of the book, which I forget at this particular point <laughs> in time, Hungry for Life. Hungry for life. <laughs> Sorry about that. So we had a bit of a discussion before we got started, and I think I just kind of like lost my train of thought. So today, <laughs> today Rachel is going to be sharing her story of overcoming anorexia and anorexia and coming out better for it. Um, so how are you going today, Rachel? I'm very well. Thank you, Damien. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. So let's get right into it and let's start at the beginning. Um, you know, as a child growing up, we believe, you know, from what, I've, what I was able to read a little bit about your book, that's where the initial signs of what became an issue later in life kind of were fermenting. So perhaps you can kind of walk us through what was actually happening and what were the initial signs you were kind of like seeing. Sure, sure. Well, the... Um the initial signs before I actually started the behaviors of an eating disorder could be seen at around four or five when I was in nursery school or kindergarten, um, where I just didn't fit in. I didn't quite know why. I felt like I was different. I was very um, anxious socially, and it caused me to be um, bullied a lot, a lot of bullying. Um, and I just felt so much anger. Um, I ended up getting singled out by teachers for being the bad kid. I don't quite remember what I did that was bad, <laughs> but apparently got into some trouble. But I, I had this identity at that point at such a young age of being a bad kid, someone who doesn't fit in. And then I sort of took that with me throughout elementary school until about third grade. Um, when I felt like I needed some sort of control and I didn't know what I could have control over. I felt out of control. And I realized that I could control my grades. If I study really hard, and it's only third grade, <laughs> if I work really hard and spend hours on my homework, I can get all A's. And so this perfectionistic quality started coming out, um, which and perfectionism and anorexia nervosa go hand in hand very often. Um, so I started obsessing about that. Um, I started obsessing about everything being in its proper order. This developed into obsessive compulsive disorder um, where everything had to be an even number, four preferably. Um, everything needed to be lined up perfectly. Um, the whole turning on and off the faucets, when I can breathe in, when I can breathe out, I was actually controlling my breathing depending on what I thought I needed to do in the moment. Um, if I said something for a while, I had to whisper it to myself again to make it an even number that I said it twice. Um, so it was really uh, interfering with my life quite a bit. At the same time, I was online at um, the school lunch, the school lunch line. And when I got to the end, there had always been two different color cartons of milk and I never understood why. I took the one that looks normal. And I finally asked the, the uh, lady who took our dollar for lunch. <laughs> this was back in the olden days <laughs> when lunch cost a dollar. Um, I said, what's the difference? What does what the, the blue one mean? And she goes, oh, that's skim milk. And I said, what is that? She goes, well, that one doesn't have any fat in it. What? Wait a minute. Fat? Fat makes you fat, right? So the one that I've been drinking, I'm, I've been drinking fat? Oh, my God. You know, so that that was like a very messed up wake up call to me. So I started choosing the skim milk. And then later on, we did an experiment in science where we um, learned how starch was in bread. And one of the children in the class said, oh, starch makes you fat. Now I have to give up bread. And slowly I started losing weight um, when I should have been gaining, um, still singled out, still bullied, still very, very shy and anxious to myself, still a lot of um, pent up anger where I, I never, I, I still don't know where that started. I grew up in such a loving home. I had everything I could want. Um, so 
all I could think of is it was some sort of genetic inclination. Um, and then whatever happened environmentally for me to interpret or perceive it in a sort of messed up way. Um, so I, I went like back and forth a little bit, like a little healthier, a little unhealthier throughout the years, throughout high school. And it wasn't until college when I was on my own and I was able to make all my own decisions, bad decisions. <laughs> I kept up the studying. I kept up the all A fixation. I would stay up all night uh, working on um, a paper and, and just get all the extra credit. And so crazy like that with my black coffee and cutting food more and more and more and more and more. And um, I actually made some friends at the beginning of college who I adore. Um, and I lost them because I just shut myself out. I didn't participate in anything. I didn't have, you know, what's called the best years of your life. I was just living in my, my bubble. Um, so when I graduated junior year, I was pretty skeletal. And I ended up um, being forced to go in the hospital. I went for a, a checkup. They saw my weight and they were like, oh, you're not going home. And this hospital experience, which was pretty much over the entire summer, um, was one of the most traumatic things of my life. It wasn't an eating disorders clinic. It was a uh, psychiatric floor, inpatient floor, with a few people who had some eating, eating disorders. So this is not staff that was trained. So basically there were um, rules, you know, that, that had, so everybody was the same. It was assumed that because I starved myself, I must also throw up. So I had to be watched going to the bathroom. And it was just very dehumanizing. Um, they just gave you food to eat without you being able to make any decision. And they said, clear your tray. And it was massive amounts of calories all of a sudden with no guidance, no compassion, no validation. I ended up just eating what I needed to eat as scary as it was to gain the weight so I could get out of the hospital because I just needed to leave that place. So I, it was that bad that I would, was willing to, you know, venture on my, my biggest fear of gaining weight at that point. And, uh, and they let me go because insurance ran out as well. Insurance just does not pay for the kind of rigorous treatment somebody needs um, very often it runs out and then somebody relapses. And that's exactly what happened to me. I was not re recovered enough to leave. And I went back to college and it was good for a while. And I followed my nutrition plan and I measured things and slowly but surely I started letting it go. I started losing weight. I became a ghost. I became a total skeleton. And by graduation, I got my diploma weighing 69 pounds and I'm five feet, four inches. Um, I wanted to do theater. That was the only thing that interested me. I went to school for theater. I had no other interests. Um, it looked like everyone else was really involved and, and having fun and, and interested in things and having passion. And I was sort of on this, um, you know, behind this brick wall, looking out through a tiny window at the rest of the world who were living and, and I didn't get it. I was like, what are they like, you know, is it, is it phony or they, I don't understand how you can have, I was just so depressed and I couldn't, I couldn't see how you could live that way without just wanting to kill yourself. Um, I had just been in this dark place for, for so, so long. And the problem is when you lose so much weight, your brain changes, there's really no way out of it. Your brain shrinks, their neuro pathways are shifted. And so it propels you more and more into this eating disorder, which is really a, a, a just a, <laughs> a horrible thing. The good news is, is that when you gain weight and start coming out of it, your brain does its neuroplasticity, it does redevelop and, and then you can actually become healthier and receive therapy. So I went into the hospital a second time against, again, forced um, and absolutely flipped out because I, the first time it had been so traumatic. This one was a lot better. This one was for an eating disorder floor in the hospital and there was compassion and there was validation. And then, you know, it was absolutely horrible and horrendous and terrifying. And I cried all the time and I didn't speak for weeks, but I got through it. And as I started getting better, like I said, brain function started to come back. Um, and when my insurance ran out, I went right into a day program. And at that point I knew that I needed that at this point I was for my 
recovery. I wasn't before, I would have rather died. Um, so I went to this day program, it was five days a week, all day. So I still had that rigorous supervision, um, but they also did things like, like the hospital taught us how to eat better. This place taught you sort of how to live and, and integrate into life again. Um, we would have like tennis lessons and dance lessons and we would watch movies and, you know, we'd go for frozen yogurt and I would not be allowed to take a half hour to eat it, <laughs> you know, but all of these things, we went shopping and I, I honestly wasn't interested in any of it at the beginning. Um, still very, very depressed, still very dark into myself, but I went through the motions and little by little, as the weight came back, as, as the neural activity came back. I started to get a little interested in things again. And um, I, I wanted to try it, this thing called life. You know, I, I didn't, people looked like they loved it so much. I wanted to give it a shot. I wondered, you know, is it even possible for me to have a romantic relationship? Is it possible for me to pursue theater and really get somewhere with it? Um, probably can't ever have a baby after what I've done to my body, but I wonder. Um, so uh, that's, um, that's how I started to recover. And then it took many years after that. I mean, it was still a very uphill battle, but you commit and it's better than the alternative. I definitely didn't want to be in and out of hospitals. That was not going to happen. So that came down to life or death. And I chose life. I'm very, very glad I did. <laughs> because it ended up working out very well. And I have a life now that I love and I have a husband and I have a daughter. Could not, I, you know, we were trying to get pregnant. I'm like, this is never going to happen after what I was through. I got pregnant quite quickly and it just blew my mind that the body can repair itself enough. Like it's just, we're, we're so built for survival. Um, and it's just, it's just fascinating to me how much the body can heal itself. Um, you know, when we, when we give it the chance. So, awesome. No, no, it's a great story. So let's unpack a couple of things. Cause like, um, you know, this moment in childhood is kind of like interesting for me. Like I, I mentioned previously, like I was a fat, overweight kid, and then I also felt I was different. Um, so, so what do you think this is? Because I don't think it's genetics or something. It's just something happens in this early kind of like stage because I think it's useful to kind of like explore it because when we've got kids um, later on, how do we make sure they don't, have that same feeling about themselves and go off and make these choices, which are like suboptimal for us. Mm -hmm. um, I do think genetics plays a, a big part. I think we're, it's not the only part, but I think we're wired to perceive the world in a different way um, when we're lacking some, you know, essential neurotransmitters or, dopamine or serotonin or what have you, it, whatever it is that the, there's an imbalance there. Um, bipolar ran in my family, depression ran in my family, all that stuff is very, you know, really increases the likelihood that a child is going to have a mental disorder. Um, and so I think that it gave me that fear. Um, I didn't want to talk to other kids. I was so afraid they wouldn't like me. So I had this sort of um, self-loathing and I never, I never thought before, I, I didn't know why I was so angry and why I had that. But I, you know, I, I honestly think it was just because of the way I was wired, the way I was interpreting things, even the way my, my parents were raising me, it was all meant well, but my dad teased a lot. And I took some of that very seriously, you know, so it's, and, and were I another kid, I might've been just like, ah, stop dad, you know, <laughs> but I wasn't, I was somebody who took things very seriously. And I saw it again with my daughter because now, you know, I'm like, now I'm looking for all the red flags, right? You know, so I'm, I'm really, really looking for her. And, um, and despite all of our efforts, my husband's and my efforts, she still ended up with very high anxiety, some depression and even some self-loathing. Um, and she was very aggressive. And we went through years of, of like right away, I was like, okay, we need to do something. We need to get help and, and um, help her function and, 
and relate to people socially. And, and um, so we went through years of inaccurate diagnoses, um, some medications that did not work, some therapies that did not work until we finally recently got an accurate diagnosis um, of autism spectrum disorder and um, very high functioning. And then with other sort of comorbidities, um, it's complex like we all are, but we found the doctor who gets her, we found the medication that helps and now we are well on the road. So that I'm just saying that is a sort of an example of how nothing needs to happen necessarily. There doesn't need to be a trauma it's the trauma that's going on in the child's brain. It's just how we're seeing the world, how we're taking it in. And, and, you know, the earlier you catch that, the, the better. I think that if somebody had seen the red flags around me really early and took my hand and said, Hey, let's, let's do something about this. It, we may have avoided an eating disorder. My life may have been really, really different. Um, so. <laughs> oh, and then also think, We've got the society built around not celebrating individuality, like we have to conform. And if you don't conform, you don't fit in and everyone treats you that you're not conforming. And then I think we're actually not built to be necessarily all the same because if we did, we wouldn't have any of these exceptional people out there. So I think if your parents want you to conform and be like everyone else, but you feel like you're different and then they kind of like say you're different and they kind of like focus, puts the focus on you to kind of like identify you're different. Then the teachers want you to be like everyone else. And then you go, I'm different. And then that can kind of like build the mm -hmm. foundations as well. Like, as you said, like you probably have something that makes you unique not different necessarily. You just have a different outlook and you have different interests and different ways of doing things and approaching. You may be a little bit more thinking in a different way and then everyone goes, well, you're not normal and then suddenly you take it all on board because we're pretty, I guess, like susceptible when you're younger. So I think, mm. you know, for me as a parent, like being 10, like I try to celebrate my son being younger, uh, being different when he's younger. Like I go, you don't have to be like everyone else. You can be who you are. I mean, like, do you want to be like everyone else? Like, I don't want to be like anyone else kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I think perhaps society also kind of like feeds what's already happening. Mm -hmm. And then you, if you don't identify it, you can kind of like evolve, go down a particular path like you have. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. I, I grew up in a town. Well, you know, this was also a long time ago. This was in the 80s. And I grew up in a town where everybody had the same house. Everybody wore the same clothes. Everybody acted the same way. And you were in or you were out. Um, you know, everyone was named Jennifer. <laughs> it was just the time <laughs> of Jennifer's. Um, so uh, it was, um, it, it was you know, one ethnicity, one religion. It's, that was it, um, conformity. And there was one school. I had one elementary school. I grew up in Wanta. It was Wanta Elementary School, Wanta Middle School, Wanta High School. That was it. There were no other choices. Um, so when I, you know, started, like you said, feeling like I wasn't like everybody else, it's um, for me, it was absolutely terrifying. And oh my gosh, um, no one's going to like me. My parents aren't, are, you know, going to be disappointed in me. Um, and, you know, again, I, I don't think my parents ever gave me a reason to think that I needed to do be a certain way or they'd be disappointed, but somehow I got that message or I, I interpreted something that way. Um, and, and it's, it's scary. And so that creates a lot of um, anxiety around other people. And when you're little and you have anxiety around other people and you're a little quirky, a little different, you're going to get bullied. And um, I probably don't have to talk about the damage that does. That's, you know, huge. Um, I'm thrilled that my daughter is growing up um, in New York city where we do celebrate individuality, um, you know, the quirkier, the better. Um, and that there are so many different schools and I've been to almost all of them. <laughs> I've, I went into it, like I've looked at all these different schools and they're all amazing. And then I found one that fits her, that she, she gets her needs met and she's making wonderful friends and she's making and they're all different they're all from different parts of the world and, you know so this is a this is wonderful to me I, I wish i had had this when i was younger but I'm, I'm so happy that she has it but yeah i think that was one of the biggest things is that i wasn't like everybody else or at least i felt like i wasn't like 
everyone else. And that was a self-fulfilling prophecy. I singled myself out more and more. Yeah. So now let's talk about that moment where you made the decision to kind of like change. So it's the second time in hospital. So how did that happen? Because like a lot of people don't change, do they? They, they, they would have gone through the same path you have and they didn't have that moment, which obviously you did, which led you on a path to where you are today. Yeah. So what, what, what was it? It was rock bottom. Like you, you normally hear about people needing to hit rock bottom before they can, you know, be enticed to make a decision to, to change. And this was really rock bottom. Like I, I knew if I kept doing what I was doing, I was going to die. Um, I, I figured I had, I had three choices. This was when I was not talking and I was depressed and I was in the hospital and I was curled up um, by myself. And I realized I had three choices. I could, you know, gain the weight at the hospital and then go out and do what I want and go back and forth um, until it killed me or just live out my life that horrible, traumatic way. That was a no. Um, <laughs> and then the other one was I could, um, I could die because I was um, considering suicide very seriously and had been for a long time. Or I could live, which was the scariest option of all, because I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that looked like for me. Um, a lot of people who develop eating disorders had a life before the eating disorder. So it's, it's a matter of how do I get back to that life that I had, that healthy, good, nurturing life that I had. I started so young that I never had a life. I never had anything like that. I didn't know what I was, I had nothing to get back to. I just had this huge unknown, which is just the scariest thing ever when you, you don't know what's ahead of you. Um, and I thought, well, if I, I think, like I said before, if I, if I kill myself, I'm missing out on all of these things that might happen, theater, partner, my parents would be miserable, I wouldn't see, you know, my sister. So all of these little things, and it was way deep inside me, but little things started coming up, like maybe I should give this a chance, because there might be something to it. Um, you know, and I just so I started eating and, and complying. And I, you know, I guess I figured like, oh, if it doesn't work out, I could always go back to the suicide thing. <laughs> but like I said, I, you know, you start getting better. And, um, and this time I was much more committed and I had a much better staff. That's, that's so key is getting into the right treatment program. And, um, it, you know, at the beginning, at least if you're as sick as I was, it's got to be 24 seven. And if it stops being inpatient, you got to keep going to a, an outpatient program um you know there's the the money problem the insurance problem which is a whole other story and a whole other reason people are not getting better um but it's it's really imperative that that you have that round the clock um help so basically it was like building on little things and then you kind of like built the foundation you went from there so now let's talk a little bit about you know, you've gone through this experience, you had this passion for kind of like acting, but now you're, you got another passion, which is like wellness. So mm -hmm. how did that kind of evolve from, you know, from rock bottom evolving, day patients becoming aware that you wanted to actually live life and enjoy life. And then what led to the change of direction towards more of a wellness kind of like uh, spectrum? Sure. Um I almost immediately started auditioning right when I was out of the hospital and I got some great theater gigs and I worked and um, after a few years of it, um, it got very tiresome. It was a lot of auditioning. It was a lot of rejection. So here's the irony is like, that's the worst profession somebody with an eating disorder can pick. You know, so much is about your image, how you look, the shape of your body, the height. I mean, I lost one role that they were like, oh, we really wanted to cast you, but you were four inches too tall. And another one because, oh my God, you're amazing, but um, you're not blonde. You know, so it's just like all this uh, about looks and that you have no control. This is, you know, eating disorders are about having control, particularly anorexia with that perfectionism. And you're, you're, whether you work or not is completely in someone else's hands. I mean, of course you can bring your best to the table, but uh, that, you know, after that it's, 
who knows, you know, is it they have an image in their mind or that who, you know, you might remind them of their sister who they hate or whatever. Um, so that got um, tiresome. And also my work kept taking me out of New York. I did a lot of um, tours and regional theaters and I had eventually met someone who I'm now married to, who I didn't want to keep leaving New York and, and, and not being with them for, you know, six months at a time. Um, so, oh, another big reason is because of the day jobs. So when you're not working, which could be, you know, you don't know if it's going to be a week or a month or several months, the day jobs you have to have in between because, you know, I, I, it's not a career, it's just to make money. Well, you know, so it was, you know, retail and telemarketing and it was driving me insane. I, I was like, I, my brain is dying in these things. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, what else can I do? All my eggs were in the theater basket. I had no other, never even occurred to me to do anything else. Um, so my then boyfriend, now husband, um, helped me just brainstorm a million things and health sciences and wellness just kept coming up again and again and again and again. Um, and I was like, I think I need to pick something from this <laughs> yeah. very large section. Um, I, I thought about it. I researched it. I found the Swedish Institute in New York City, which is a great massage therapy school. And I applied even while I was in a show in Florida. I applied. They said, come in for an interview. I said, I'm in Florida. <laughs> but when I went back, I visited and I was just like, this this looks great. Um, so I when and I, I, I just I took a leap of faith. I mean, it was huge. I, I was going through theater withdrawal. Like I really was, you know, I remember just crying and heaving going through withdrawal. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I got really busy in my, in my new um, schoolwork and practice and clinics and, um, and then building a private practice. And, it, you know, the, it just went from there. I got more interested in different aspects of health and wellness. I got different certifications and I was writing um, lots of wellness newsletters. And then I started my YouTube channel, um, which I never expected to grow as much as it did. So I'm, I'm thrilled. And so it's that growth and the feedback I get on it that inspires me to come up with new ideas and, and do more. And so this, this life was, was built <laughs> one brick at a time, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, brilliant. So now let's kind of like talk a little bit about eating disorders because I uh, believe you, and then we'll talk a little bit about your book after this, but I believe in doing the book, you also did quite a bit of research. Um, so, and then you've, you know, spent a lot of time understanding the issues you've had. So now we can talk a little bit about that to kind of like help people be more informed. So let, let's start off with quite simple. What is an eating disorder? Hmm. An eating disorder on the surface um, is using food for something other than nourishment. So either either the um, either restricting food or um, binging on it in order to fulfill a need. It's it it has a function. So whether it's um, a lack of, you know, feeling a need to communicate something you don't know how to communicate any other way, um, a way to punish yourself if you feel like you deserve to be punished. Um, it could be a, a way of getting control, like, you know, I had a lot of control. It could be anger, depression, uh, it, it just so, so many things. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think it's, it's just about the food, but that's a symptom. It's a very dangerous symptom. It's a symptom that can kill, but it's just a symptom of all these other things. It's, it's very similar to pretty much any addiction that just kind of spins out of control. Um, you know, you start it as a, a, sometimes it could be even like feels, it feels healing. Like I, I felt, I liked the feeling of being empty. It just somehow was um, a safe and secure place for me to be. Um, and when you get comfortable that way, it's it's so hard to change. And it, for just in general, it's so hard for humans to make a change. So even if you think the change might be something better, you're more comfortable with what you know. Um, so you stick with that. 
So basically that's, um, you know, so that's how that can start. It could start from uh, dieting. Um, I've, I've known people to tell their stories about how I just wanted to lose five pounds, but then there, you know, they had an inclination towards uh, obsessive personality or, or addictive personality. And they kept, well, I'm five pounds, I'll, I'll lose a couple more because everyone's saying I look so great, you know, so I'll lose a couple more. And then some other, you know, not so bright person says, wow, you look amazing. Look how skinny you are. And they, that's, wow, well, I'll do it more. And then, then the brain and then the, all the other stuff starts to come in. Um, there are several different kinds of eating disorders. I had anorexia, which is, um, restriction or uh, starvation. Um, there's uh, bulimia nervosa, which usually constitutes um, binge eating, you know, insanely high amounts of calories and very off often purging as well, either with, um, with vomiting or with um, laxatives. Um, now all these, it's, it's, you know, these are common, but not, not all. And there are lots of overlaps and, and, um, you know, just uh, muddied in between and, and, and sometimes comorbidities with other things, maybe, um, you know, uh, also other pills aside from laxatives that you might be ab abusing or, or self-harm or cutting or things like that, that all, you know, everyone's got their own, um, their own way of expressing something that needs to be dealt with that, that needs attention. So basically anyone who has this need to be in control and feels insecure in some way and doesn't have much self-love could be a person who may go down the eating disorder road. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. So that's some people's reasons for, for doing it. And, you know, somebody who feels that way may just as well go down, um, uh, just any, any number of things like, uh, you know, like, uh, like alcohol or like gambling or like uh, abusive relationships or, you know, some sort of self harm, um, in order to justify how they're feeling, communicate something, control something, um, punish themselves, what, whatever the, the reason is, it, it, it could go down any route. And, you know, I think that that's, again, your genetics and your environment, um, that, that often, you know, it's kind of dictates what, what vice you're going to have, um, you know, and then, and then that vice really becomes a, a serious health problem. Yep. So in your case, it started reasonably early, but I think now there's statistics indicating that even later in life, there are more and more people who are developing eating disorders. So, so why could that be occurring? So like, younger people we kind of like understand they're not well developed and then you know they're looking for things to attach themselves to but mm -hmm. someone later in life developing an eating disorder so what's your understanding and why that's you know growing and prevalence now mm -hmm. well it's, it's um from what i understand it's growing for all ages and it's still most prevalent um i think in females 12 to 25 if i'm not mistaken um, but it does, it can affect it and it does affect anyone, any race, culture, ethnicity, gender, what, what have you age. Um, we're getting more stories about it. Um, I think one, because it's actually getting worse. It's actually getting more, you know, becoming more of an epidemic. Um, but another one is that it's being reported more, more people are seeking health, uh, health, help and health. Um, when I was, when I was young, it was still quite taboo. It was weird. No one understood it. You didn't really want to tell anybody. And now we have this explosion of help. Um, even online, you know, you can, you can find out information, you can get help anonymously. If you do feel, you know, um, a little scared saying something, there are groups now on the internet is a little, um, you know, there's good and bad. You, you can go to some really horrible sites and go down bad roads with it. But if you're if you're looking for the right places, um, but that's just to say that it's um, it's it's much more known and accepted as as a thing, as a as a illness like any other illness and one that needs attention. Um, and uh, I think it's probably most evident in kids because they're being, you know, watched by parents and they're growing and, um, and they start losing weight. That's, you know, pretty evident if you're 12. Um, 
However, um, very often later in life, well, there's one thing is um, moms maybe who were pregnant and can't get back their belly that they had before. That's one way that can, can develop, but it can develop absolutely the same way as anyone else. You know, it, you could be depressed, you could need an outlet. Um, and, uh, and I think that too, is that more, more people are recognizing the disorder in um, people in forties and fifties, whereas they wouldn't before they would call it something else, or, you know, maybe somebody got sick or, or passed away from electrolyte imbalance but it was because they were starving, you know, or, 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 or purging, um, or, uh, you know, any number, any number of things, or like they have terrible osteoporosis. Well, that's because they're not getting the nutrition they need, but it's, it could be called other things and it could be confused and looked over when you're, when you're an adult, I think more easily. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were a lot more cases than actually are being reported as, as adults. Okay. But with the pandemic, it, exploded. Like it, it's it more, I think it's more than two times the amount of disorders. It, it, it went up. Um, it skyrocketed the cases, um, having the trauma of being closed in and just with food and you can't move and exercise. And, and now you're on the internet all the time and you're seeing everybody else and you're comparing you're, and, and just the, the, the trauma and not being able to handle what's happening in the world. Um, just, yeah, that just made it skyrocket, unfortunately. Okay. And so how can, um, you know, friends, family see that there's a problem and then, you know, kind of like be aware there's a need to intervene. So, mm -hmm. so w what are the things? Because like, as you said, like a lot of people go through and then they're not identified and then, and then eventually it leads to bad consequences. So, so what can people do? How can you be aware of what's happening? Um, I think sometimes you can't, but you can look for cues like, um, like strange eating habits, um, not being able to eat in front of anyone, anyone else, but taking your food and eating in isolation. Um, or just if you eat with this person, seeing them not eat maybe very much. Um, so that's like the, the food end of it. Um, there might be some uh, depression, some they're not themselves. Um, they might be cold a lot more of the time. Um, as you lose weight, you don't, you don't have as much um, body fat to, to protect you. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody is so different, so it's so hard to say, but, um, if somebody's really ruminating and, and obsessing and, and you're with them a lot, you know, you'll start noticing something's up. Um, now, unfortunately, as like a friend, you can't make somebody do something. You can't, you can't force them to change, but you can, you know, be by their side, say, I'm here for you. I am willing to listen. Um, I know a great therapist. How about you visit them just one session, see what you think, you, you know, like not, not pushy because that'll often make somebody go back more. Um, but just letting them know that you're there for them. Now, if it's a kid, um, I mean, it, if it, if it's, looking like it's really a, like a very serious problem, a very chronic problem, and even a life-threatening problem. As a parent, you, you, if they don't go into the hospital, you have to, you're going to have to force them. You have to get, you know, legally, if they're under 18, you know, um, and actually my parents were threatening to do that after when I, when I graduated from college, they said, um, you know, we can get uh, legal, um, you know, the right to, to make that decision for you. We can take you to court. They're going to take one look at you and say, yes, we, we can make your health decisions. Um, and I think, I think as a parent, if you're, if your kid's going down that road, you've, you've just got to do it. Um, even, even if it's traumatic and just make it as, as smooth as you possibly can, you know, again, be there. I'm here for you. I understand. You can talk to me. Um, everyone here is, is here to help you. Um, maybe 
reminding them of all the awesome things that they do and, and that they live, you know, like, um, oh, it's going to be so great when you get back to soccer. Oh, remember that sleepover you had with your friends, you know, like getting out of the disorder and back into life a little bit and, and giving them something to work towards. Um, like, oh yeah, I was pretty, pretty happy doing that or, you know, something along those lines. It's a, t it's a, it's a good question and a tough one to answer. Um, but overall, if I was just going to give a simple one, the best is to be there for them. Yeah. No, awesome. So, and then now someone like yourself who kind of like hits rock bottom, what kind of like a message would you like to give to them? And then, you know, guide them into the journey to kind of like recovery and then getting back to living life. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> hopefully, if you're listening to this and having a problem and I'm not too late, you can prevent rock bottom <laughs> by doing <laughs> something now. <laughs> you don't need it. But but the thing is that I was I was on my deathbed and now I'm here. So, I mean, when they say it's never too late, it's really never too late. You can turn this around. You can get the help you need and, and it, you have to do it with help. I, I don't know how anybody could do it on their own, honestly. Um, I think you can if it's, if it's disordered eating and not an eating disorder, there's a line between <laughs> the two. But if it's actually a disorder, get help. It is so worth it on the other side. I know it's so easy to be where you're comfortable. You're going to end up losing so much valuable time that you could be sharing and pursuing a passion and being with people who, who love you and nurture you. And, uh, you know, there's just so, so much more to life. Um, you know, I started doing my YouTube video. I started writing. I just finished writing another book, a novel, actually. I never knew I could be a writer. I'm a mom. I'm a massage therapist. I help people. I, it's just, it's, it's, there's so much, <laughs> there's just so much, um, that you can do. And, you know, even if you're not feeling like it's possible right now, you just have to get better first. You have to get over that, over that hump, trust the people who are trying to help you. Awesome. So now let's talk a little bit about your first book and then sometime in the future, we can talk about your novel. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what inspired you to uh, write your first book, Hunger for Life? I think that it was out of frustration at first um, because of what I had gone through in recovery and because so many people were misguided about what was wrong, um, including, you know, people throughout college, um, my friends who didn't know what the heck and like stayed away or, um, so I was really frustrated that, that nobody understood. And I thought, well, now I'm thinking clearly, I have a healthy brain and I understand what I went through. Maybe if I can write this down in a way people can understand and really pull them into my brain, pull them into my mind um, and take them through. I'm a very unreliable narrator, but you know it at the same time, you know, so so you're going through my journey, but also there's an objective point of it. Um, then maybe we can have a little more compassion validation, help, understanding, empathy, um, which would be huge. I mean, that means the world to people who are struggling for their loved ones and, and friends to be able to understand and be there. Um, so I think it was out of frustration at first. And then I, you know, it's my obsessive compulsive. I just kept writing, 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 <laughs> writing. <laughs> Sometimes it serves you. Um, and, uh, and then, I mean, it was, it was done over the course of 10 years. I, I put it down. I picked it up. I completely rewrote it several times, um, not really knowing where I was going with it, if it was just going to be a journal. And then I decided I think I wanted to be a book and, and started, you know, taking it very seriously. And um, it was, you know, a lot of people think it's cathartic and it wasn't while I was writing it. It was actually just painful. I didn't really know why I was putting myself through it. <laughs> um, no, I knew why, because I wanted people to answer it. It was really, it was written more for care, caregivers, um, friends, family, parents in mind than even for the sufferer, although it's, it's very helpful for them too. Um, 
but I, you know, I, I cried. I surprised myself by laughing sometimes while I was writing it, but it was just really difficult. And it wasn't until I was all finished that I realized there was, you know, some catharsis there because until then it had sort of bled into my life now, like, oh yes, I'm a recovering anorexic and this whole, this whole experience is still me. Um, to, you know, there's a book that has a beginning, middle and end. I can close it and I can put it on the shelf. And that was the, that part of my life. Not that it doesn't affect me. Of course, we're all, you know, affected by all of our, our um, past experiences, but it has its place in my life and it doesn't have to be now. So, so just having that like physical book, <laughs> you know, was like, was like almost very symbolic for me to, to, I can put that away now, you know? So you said the book was for not necessarily the person going through the issue, but for other people. So, so what were you hoping to show them to allow them to have more empathy and understanding of what the person is going through? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, certainly for parents to, um, to take action much sooner. Um, you know, I, I went on way too long way, way too long. I was very convincing and I was very sneaky um, and pretended I was fine a lot. So, you know, they didn't really know, but if you know this stuff and you know what to look for and you see something that's a little not right, you know, look into it. And, and, and if your kid needs help, for God's sake, get them help, you know, before it, it goes too far. Um, the earlier you catch it, the earlier you treat it, the better chance of a successful outcome for the, a longer period of time. So you get longevity in the, in the, uh, in the treatment and hopefully never, never visit it again. Um, yeah. And then for, for others, you know, like, like I said, I just had so many people that, uh, you know, I even had, I had people who were mad at me, like, why are you, why are you being such a bitch to me? You know, or something like that when really I didn't, I wasn't anything. I was a, I was a shell. Um, and I never meant to hurt anybody by it aside from myself. Um, but I think that if, if, if more people got this, if more people really knew it's not just about eating and, and really got into the mind, um, you know, and I, of course I'm just one person, but a lot of what I experienced is, is very common, um, to a lot of people who, who suffer with these disorders. Um, if you can really get that empathy, then you can really get the person and then you might really be able to make a difference, like a significant difference in their lives. I think I would have if, if I had, um, you know, someone who got me. Awesome. And how did it feel to finally get the book out there? Because as you said, it's been a journey, like 10 years in the making. So mm -hmm. how did it actually feel to you now? It's out there in the world. Um, I mean, it was, it was amazing. I, when I finished my final draft, I screamed and scared my husband. I was like, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to <laughs> let that out. And then after I um, sent the email to everybody I knew telling them now it's available on Amazon, I think I broke down after. It was like it was like a weird panic attack. Like it was just all that pent up like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm doing this, you know. And, um, and so it was it was very exciting. It was also really scary. And not because, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you're so brave. You told your story to everybody. And, you know, I don't care. I'm like, I'm literally an open book. I, I, I will, I don't feel nervous telling, except my parents. You know, I didn't always see them in the best light. And a lot of that not best light is in my book. <laughs> and so I was very nervous. I didn't want to hurt them. I didn't, you know, I tried to explain, this is my memory. Memories are not necessarily accurate. And I definitely wasn't thinking straight at the moment when I, you know, I, I went back in time. That's not how I feel now so blah, 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 to my parents. Um, and I thought my, my, my dad would, would take it the hardest. They were fantastic. <laughs> they were fantastic. They, I, um, I was talking to my dad on the phone and, um, and I, I almost went to apologize and he goes, Oh, Rachel, I didn't know you were such a good writer. <laughs> broke down. So I was, um, I was glad to get over that and glad that my parents understood. And, and I said, you know, if, if anything, people who read it are going to feel really sad, you know, really bad for you. Like they're going to 
you know, <laughs> they're going to empathize with you like, oh, dear God, look what you had to go through. <laughs> <laughs> rather than saying like what did you do yeah um no because they were they were wonderful so that was my that was my scary part of it but the rest was all wonderful awesome so before we kind of like finish up there's one question that kind of like um kind of like interested in understanding so once you've gone through and you have this kind of a like an illness how do you make sure that you don't relapse you know like you've built your whole life now and you're obviously thriving so but with any kind of like addiction or any of these kind of things there's always that possibility isn't it so what would be your advice to kind of like keep going forward and try to avoid going back find what you're passionate about and pursue it with your whole heart and it could be more than one thing but if you fill your life with stuff that you love and are passionate about, there's really not room for an eating disorder. Um, and if you surround yourself with people who love you and support you, they will help to keep you from going down that path. If something happens in life, that's, you know, any adversity or something, uh, trauma or something like that, hang on to the people who love you and they'll get you through it. Um, you know, I, I should say that, I, you know, I'm not, I don't, I will never consider myself fully recovered. I think I was sick for so long that it's just like that part of my brain just couldn't make that final adjustment. So that's to say that, um, you know, sometimes I'll still get a little nervous before having a piece of cake or something at a birthday, but I'll have it because I'll be like, ah, shut up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that voice. Um, and I don't think I will ever see my body the right way. Um, it's, it, the, you know, a lot of it is body image and I have this warped perception of my body and I, then, you know, again, I just need to tell myself to shut up. And if I, if I start thinking about it, I remind myself how unbelievably unimportant it is, <laughs> how there are, you know, my life is filled with so many things that are so much more important, important. And not only that, but no one cares, <laughs> you know, like no one cares what shape your belly is, honestly, <laughs> um, unless you're, you know, acting and modeling and, you know, but um, which I don't recommend if you have an eating disorder, <laughs> but, um, but honestly, you know, no one cares. And there's, there's just more important stuff to think about. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I would say. And, and, and just keep doing what you love. You know, if you're doing stuff that like, you don't really like, you're going to start looking for other things. But if you're excited about life, and you're waking up each day, you know, glad about who you're going to see and what you're going to do and know that there are um, possibilities and, you know, not to say you have to be like on La La Land all the time, but just, you know, have have that passion for life, have that passion for living. And, and I don't think you'll I think you'll treat yourself very well. <laughs> awesome. So here are some closing questions, um, which I'm asking everyone. So we've previously spoken, so it's kind of like a recap of some of them and a couple of additional ones. Um, mm -hmm. Given our audience is kind of like focused on the approaching and over 40, so what does ageless living mean to you? Um, ageless living... I think is, um, is, is what I said about passion. I, I see, I see clients in my practice who could be the same age and one of them loves tennis and goes skiing in the winter and, and is, is, you know, going to visit their friend in California next week or something, you know, and they are so young at the same age as the other person who's very sedentary who, um, you know, lies in her bed playing games on her phone, um, who stays up all night because she, you know, it, it feels like she needs to do something but doesn't want to do anything. And, you know, so that's, that's the, the kind of trap you get, you get into. Um, so I, I think you need to, you need to be social because isolation is just, you know, after quarantine, we all know that that's no good. <laughs> Um, but yeah, pursue that passion and, and, uh, and, you know, 
keep things that you love in your life. And I think you'll be a younger, you're not going to be age less, you'll still have an age, but your body and your mind and your heart will be younger than say others the same age. Awesome. So your definition of wellness? I think wellness is balance. I think it's having everything in moderation. I think it's having, um, you know, your nutrition in a good spot and your mental health in a good spot and physical health and social life and all, all the aspects of our lives. Um, if they are well-balanced, um, you know, yeah, you can have a little more of one, a little less of the other, if that's like who you are, but <laughs> you know, you want to make sure that they're all there and they're all feeding you, um, and giving you, feeding you such a great, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's such a great term for this discussion. <laughs> they're, exactly. they're nourishing you. All of those things nourish your body. So, um, yeah, that's that's what I think wellness is. Awesome. The secret to longevity. Um, well, it goes along with the the ageless living answer. Um, uh, it's probably, you know, what it's probably the sum total of the two previous questions. It's the having, you know, keeping what you love in your life and keep doing, you know, and be active and have people you love and pursue the passions that you love and also having um, your wellness in check, you know, making sure you're doing your meditation and your yoga and having your smoothie. And I don't know, that means it's just <laughs> whatever, whatever that is to you, but like nourishing your body the way it needs to be nourished. Um, I think those, those two together could, uh, I think, create a lot of longevity. <laughs> Very good. So because we're all about a legend life, what's your definition of a legend life? A, a legend life? Correct. Legend life. Which is like your best life. Yeah. Um, I think... Oh, well, I think it's the one where at the end of your life, you are satisfied. You say, yes, I did this. I had this influence and I loved this and I loved these people and I had a good life, <laughs> you know, um, because it's not, it, it doesn't need to be like everyone else's legends. You don't need to be, you know, a hero or, or you know, famous. It's your legend. That's who it matters to the most. And, and leaving that, leaving that sense of love with, um, with the people you leave behind who can remember you as a legend, <laughs> the no, ones that you care about. No, definitely. It's a, a very personal thing. So you hit it on the nail. So lastly, free life lessons you've learned in life that you would like to share with others so these are you know you've obviously learned quite a lot throughout your life up to date but there are three that kind of like really resonate with you and then you'd like to share this because you believe this would have a you know a great impact on their lives mm -hmm. other people don't care about what you think they care about <laughs> they're not they're not judging or you know sizing you up all the time or you know they're probably doing the same thing to themselves so remember that if you're nervous or anxious speaking to somebody um and then maybe make a friend that you wouldn't have made before if you had thought that they were you know judging every little thing about you and every little hair and every you know, whatever um I think I would have liked to have known that a long time ago that, you know, they're just, they're looking to make a friend too. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see. Um, oh, wow. Three life lessons. Um, if you, if you need help, get help. Um, it's okay. It's okay to ask for help. You don't have to do it yourself and actually you shouldn't do it yourself. Um, you know, there were people that went to school for that. <laughs> Let them help you. <laughs> um, and it doesn't have to be professional. It could be, you know, if you need help from your family or your friends and, you know, on, on, a, on a really like um, smaller scale, 
although it was pretty big to us recently, um, we needed to make a huge deposit for my my daughter's school. Um, and we needed to ask our family for help. And that was not, e it's not easy. It's not easy to ask to, to borrow money, you know? Um, so even, even something that simple though, it's, it's okay. People want to help you. They actually want to. <laughs> um, and the last thing I would say is if you think you can't give it a try, <laughs> just do it. If you, if it's something that you want, that's, that seems desirable to you, but you think will never happen, do it, you know? And, and then at least you could say you tried if it doesn't work, but it might work. You know, I had a baby, <laughs> <laughs> baby. <laughs> so, you know, it won't, you know, it won't all the time, but so much, so much better if you try so much better. Brilliant. Rachel, thank you so much. It's been wonderful talking to you. It's certainly been very informative and inspirational. So I'm sure a lot of people got value out of this. So for anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about you, how can I find you online? Um, well, you can find my book at hungryforlifebook.com. You can find my um, massage therapy website with um, a whole bunch of wellness articles. Um, and that's rachel-richards.com. My YouTube channel, just search Rachel Richards Massage, and you'll get hundreds of videos on self-care, self-massage, meditation, relaxation. It's it's lovely. Just you know, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> just check it out because it's just it feels great. Um, <laughs> if I do say so myself. <laughs> um, and you're free to um, email me. Um, you can email me at uh, Rachel Richards Massage at gmail.com. And my book, um, if you're interested in checking it out, is available on Amazon. You can read a, a sample on Amazon and it's um, on Kindle. It's in paperback and it's an uh, audio book um, narrated by yours truly. So. <laughs> awesome. Once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Damien. <laughs>